Hello and welcome to Wynn's Hotel here in Dublin city centre for our latest episode of Coffee at Wynn's with GTV Network. And my guest today is the uh, best-selling author and actress, uh, Claudia Carroll. Claudia, you're very welcome. Well, thank you so much. Isn't it amazing to be here? Isn't it a beautiful place? This blender. Yes, yeah. it's a fantastic <laughs> And the place. best coffee in town. Have you been here before quite I'm, a bit? Listen, are you joking me? I'm here every... Well, every time I go to a show in the Abbey or the Peacock, which is surprisingly often, this is where we meet. This is where my gang meet. Um, I had my birthday here, <laughs> just gone. Uh, so it's great. It's a great spot because you're within staggering distance to the Abbey. So you can run in, grab your tickets, get up here, get into Dave in the bar, get a nice drink, and away you go. Happy it, days. It's a fabulous... and it's, it's an so, it, there's so much. There's so much history yeah. in, in, oh, in, within yeah. the four walls of, of, of this place. Never change wins. Never change. Um, now, we, we're here to talk about your new novel, which is called The Low Algorithm, which is the story of uh, a woman in her mid-40s who's hard, very hard working but can't find love and has a lot of disastrous dates online, so she decides to use her uh, uh, mathematical skills to set up a... Uh, uh, an app that she hopes will bring true love. Is that correct? I am absolutely staggered, Ronan, because I know by the question that you have read the book. And um, that is very, very, very <laughs> impressive. Yeah, it is. It's about online dating, which, as uh, you know, I don't know if you're an online dater or if no. you ever were. No. You're well out of it. I, 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 just to point out, I have okay. never been in. Uh, You've never I, I, I did all my toe. dating in the. Uh, okay. I did all my dating in the um, in the analog world before the internet. Okay. So, well, um, I'm kind I'm of analog. Tools too digital yes. because I'm that sure. long single um, that I, I am an 80s kid who remembers the old fashioned way where if a fella, you know, if you were, if you were asking somebody out, it was, are you going for a drink? There's a few of us going for a drink on blah, blah, blah or whatever. And you met someone and you just hoped it went from there. And you did that thing mm. of swapping phone numbers. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. And then you hoped your answering machine would leave a message ah. from him. Um, and then you bored all your friends talking about it. And they were the days. And now, it's, of course, it's all online, which sort of took a long time to take off, I think. But then COVID online dating just went through the ceiling. And dating websites, just their, their um, traffic went up by something like 400% because we couldn't even meet our families and our of loved course, ones, yeah. never mind meet a potential partner. So it really took off in a big way. But there are dating websites and there are dating websites. So we will we will circle back to that point because mm. I've had so many... I did a lot of research for this book, Ronan, because you have to. Yes. And uh, some of the stories I could tell you would make your hair stand on mm. end. Like you think, geez, will I ever meet anyone? Um, no, you started off... Sorry, just to interrupt you there. You see, your book starts off with a woman, this woman Iris, who's the main character in your book, she's in her mid-40s, and she goes on an on online in, date. In a, she meets a guy, and this is a true story. Yes. And she meets wondering. him in a very fancy restaurant, which I will not say the name of, but let's just say it's, it's not Michelin starred, but it's really posh, really well known. It's the kind of restaurant people go to to celebrate roundy birthdays. Mm. The cheapest bottle of wine would be like 80 euros, you know, one of these ones. Mm. And she meets this guy there, and he said, normally for a first meeting, it would be more usual to suggest coffee. Because mm. coffee, just like we're having now, can be half hour. You know? yeah, yeah, and course, if you don't yeah. like the look of each other, yeah, it's, yeah. it's quite polite on both sides. Sure, yeah. After the half hour to go, look, really nice to meet you, and best luck, and hasta la vista. And that's okay, that's perfectly, that's yeah. what happens all the time. Um, but this particular guy suggested to this character, um, why not dinner? And she thinks, oh my God. And then when he suggests this quite high-end restaurant, she's thinking, she's saying to people, I think this guy might actually like me, you know, because it, it, he's prepared to invest a lot of money in a first mm. date. So they meet and she's vegetarian and he's ordering tapas, meat dish after meat dish, mm. duck and pork and beef and lamb and all of this. And she is thinking in her head, okay, um, maybe he just forgets or maybe he didn't read my profile properly and that happens and she forgives it. And they move on. He orders a bottle of wine, very expensive wine. And she's driving, so she's on the water. And he orders another bottle of wine and she's thinking, okay, the bill is going to be hilarious when the bill arrives. Uh, but, they, you know, they're kind of talking and she's doing all the things that you're supposed to do. She's asking questions. She's listening. She's paying attention. She's, um, you know, trying to find common ground. Mm. 
And then after the main meal is cleared away, and she's been like nibbling on lettuce because there's nothing else mm. at the table she can eat. He gets up and excuses himself and disappears. And she's uh, sort of regrouping and on her phone and doing what single ladies do when we're on our own at a table for two. You pretend to be very busy and important and on your phone. And he doesn't come back and she thinks, okay, and the waiter starts hovering and there's a queue of people, very popular restaurant, looking at her, glaring at her, thinking you're holding up a table for two, come on, you've had your go, get off. Um, and the waiter comes over and says, um, I'm sorry just to say, we, we did ask you to have the table back by X, Y, Z time. And she goes, oh, okay, right, uh, the gentleman I was with, um, is he in the bathroom or is he maybe outside taking a phone call? And the waiter goes and checks and comes back and says, no, he's not. And I can see by the look in your eyes you're ahead of me on this. So she runs out onto the street, just double checks. Is he there? Is he, you know, is there an emergency call or something? She goes on the website that they've been exchanging direct messages on, the website where they met. And in that space of time, he has deleted his profile, gone. And she goes back in, she's messaging, she's messaging, nothing, nothing. And she thinks the bill arrives and it's extortion. And she thinks, what am I going to do? Like, what am I going to do? I can't not pay. It's not the staff's fault. So she has to sort of hold her head up high and pay this ridiculous bill, leaves the restaurant with her stomach rumbling, and she thinks, that's it. That is rock bottom. It doesn't get any worse than that. So that's what the sort of catalyst for the entire story. It just goes from there. She thinks it's, you know, you know what? It's lazy algorithms sending me these eejits that I have very little in common with. And this was larceny. Um, so she thinks, well, I'm coding since I was a teenager. Why don't I have a crack at it? Like, I can't do worse. And it goes from there. And she's quite mathematical, this particular character. And she thinks, OK, she's ready to sort of test drive her algorithm a couple of months later. But she thinks, I want to appeal to all age groups. And in order to do that, I need, if you like, gay dating guinea pigs. I mm. need somebody at the Gen Z end of the, end of the market, so mm. like 20 somethings. And I need someone older, like 70 plus, silver surfers as they're called, who are very active in online mm. dating as I discovered. You know, people who are maybe widowed or separated and who just love having a plus one at things mm. and who maybe for years and years always had a partner and find it lonely now that they're newly single again, whether they wanted to be or whether through bereavement or through separation. So she recruits to dating guinea pigs and I'm not, sorry, I'm not telling you anymore. That was in my excitement to talk about the story. I knocked over the spoon. Sorry about that. But you, were, but you said at the start that this is based on a true story. Is that correct? It's, the the story at the very start, the restaurant story and the guy doing a runner. Uh, that, that is entirely true. And what's was interesting... Did it happen to you or did it happen to No, it didn't happen to me. Um, but it, uh, interestingly, I, 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 I talked to a psychologist about that story who came back and he said the guy in question to do something that appalling, like that, mm. that it's such an appalling thing to do. Okay. The guy was clearly getting more out of it than just a free meal. He was in it like, you know, was there a power trippy thing going on here or something like that? Because you wouldn't just do it for yeah. a free, free dinner, you wouldn't. Um, but I just thought it was one of the most shocking things that I heard when it comes to online dating. And I have heard pretty shocking things when it comes to online dating. And you have, have you, you have your own experience of this as well? Where oh, you listen, how long have you got, Ronan? Uh, um, I, as I say, I researched, because you have to. And um, I'll just give you one example. I met a guy online uh, on a very popular dating website, which is, I won't say the name of it, but uh, and this guy seemed really nice. And Dublin being Dublin, Ireland being Ireland, we can all get a handle on people yeah. pretty quickly. And this guy was a teacher. And uh, as it turned out, total coincidence, but I have a godson in the school where this particular, this south, very well-known south side school where this particular person taught. So I said to my godson, who's a teenager, um, do you know X, X, Y, Z? And he went, oh, yeah, 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 you know, he's sound, yeah, yeah, you should, you know, give him a word. He's, he's grand, he's one of us. So I thought, okay, praise from a teenager, doesn't get any higher than that. So we met for coffee and this particular guy had, had never been married but had a, cha had a, a teenager who would, well, a uh, sort of 12, 13 year old daughter whose mum was American from Seattle and they'd broken up and she, the mum had moved back to Seattle to mm. be with her family and had taken her teenage daughter with her. So uh, 
uh, we were chatting about that and he was saying, oh, she's my daughter. He was, you know, proud dad. And I thought that's a lovely trait in anyone. And he said, uh, she's actually making her confirmation this summer. And I said, oh my God, you, you have to go over to Seattle for it. Like that's, that's huge, that's, you know. And he said, yeah, I'm really hoping to get there. And I said, oh, you have to go. Like, it'll just mean so much to her to see mom and dad together. You're a family. You mightn't be together with her mom, but you're still a family. Yeah. And that's, you know, kids come first. And after a while, I realized the conversation, he kept looping the conversation back to money and the lack of it. And he kept saying, yeah, it's just, you know, the price of flights, it's two flights to Seattle. You go, you connect yeah, yeah, through course, New yeah. York or yeah, yeah, yeah. Philadelphia yeah. or wherever. And he said, uh, it's just, you know, cha-ching, adding up, a lot of money. And I thought, uh, there were about three or four different mentions of money. And I thought, well, you know, like, what are you telling me that for? I'm an actor, like, I'm, I'm an old, like, we, we don't yeah. make any money. Yeah. Um, so uh, after a while, he said, uh, and we were still like, uh, my coffee was still in front of me. Yeah. He said, um, he said, look, I know we've only just met. And, uh, you know, he said, I, I hate asking, but I really do want to get to this confirmation. And I just wondered, would you possibly see your way towards lending me a few quid? And I went, I just sort of froze and looked at him and I, I, I said, seriously? And I thought, I have friends 30 years, Ronan, and I wouldn't ask them for a lend of money. Uh, like, I'd, imagine I'd asking be, somebody for the lend of money on a first date. A, a total stranger. Like, I, we'd only just met the coffee, was still warm. And he was a real teacher, us. right? He was a real teacher, yeah. Right. Well-known Southside School. So I went, yeah, you know what? Really nice to meet you, and I wish you the best of luck with your search. And I left, I paid for the coffees, and left with my head held high. But I fell to thinking about it afterwards. And this is how Tinder swindlers work. And I'm not saying we met on Tinder, but just it's a sort of onomatopoeic name, the Tinder yeah. swindler. Um, I thought, I'm one of maybe how many women that that particular guy was meeting that day, that week, that month, and maybe more soft-hearted dates than me would have said, oh, because he was a nice fella. He was a very charming person would have said, look, you know, okay, look, there's what I, what I can afford to lend you. Pay me back when you get back from Seattle. You just make sure you're there for the confirmation. He could have made thousands over the... Now, that's me being evil-minded, but yeah. it is quite extraordinary. Oh, really? I mean, unbelievable. But you think all that stuff is outlandish, but then when you look at the Tinder swindler, I remember watching that on Netflix <laughs> yeah. and thinking, these are, these are clever women, they're successful women. Why are they being sucked in by this evident fraud? Because you want to fraud? be in a relationship. You, yeah. you, you tr because of that old-fashioned word, trust. You trust. You trust that you'll see them again. You trust they'll pay you back. And a lot of the time they do. And then you get sucked in deeper. And then all of a sudden it's, my mom is having major medical surgery. Mm. I don't suppose you could just hand over. And then it gets bigger and bigger. And then you're, but by then you might think, even if you've never met, and this happens, even if it's just virtual, you might think, well, I'm in a relationship with this person. This is my boyfriend. Mm. This is my partner. Mm. And that's how they cash in. Wow. Quite frightening, isn't it? And then um, I went on another date uh, with a fella who was, I mean, I kind of didn't think it was going to go anywhere because we'd so little in common, but he was very funny and we just had a great laugh mm. and we sort of parted and it was just, you know, it, it, it clear that mm. it wasn't going to go any further. But then these texts started coming through to my phone of, um, are you familiar with the term dick pics? I know, but I can imagine. Right. <laughs> Do you want to? Ta we, we, we needn't take it any further because yeah, yeah. it's a family podcast. Uh, but I just thought this was coming through to my phone. And as I say, I'm an 80s kid. Yeah. I'm analog world yeah. of dating like yourself. And this coming through to the phone and you think, seriously, like seriously, is that meant to be a, a turn on? Yeah. Um, I just found it astonishing. But this is the way dating is now. You're well out of it, Ronan. Well, I, it sounds like I, yeah. I, I, I guess I guess it is it, it is a pool of sharks. But but I was just thinking there. Your book made me think about the best way of meeting people. And in the old school, as you mentioned, you know, you the analog world or the the, the real world, you met somebody by chance usually in a club or a pub or whatever. And now you have it online dating. And notwithstanding your own issues with online dating, which do you think is the best way to meet somebody? I think bring back the slow set. Right. That is what I think. Right. I think you couldn't go wrong. You knew where you stood. 
and sure. everybody stood sweating around the edge of the dance floor. The ladies generally made a dive to top up the lipstick. And unless some fella grabbed you in the meantime, you just went into the ladies and had a yak with your pals. Um, but I think you knew where you stood back yes. then. Um, having said that, online dating is, it's not gonna change. It's only gonna get bigger. Um, which is a lot of the reason why I wrote, wrote the book in the first place. Um, and it is so successful. Like, I have been, I'm mm. sure you have too, mm. I've been to weddings. Yeah, of course. Of couple, yeah. people who met online, who in a million trillion years wouldn't have had that much in common, who never would have met in the old school way, who never would have, and maybe you can go down the Julia Roberts, George Clooney rom-com route and think, oh, we'll just be in a room together and our eyes will meet across the room mm. and it'll just go from there and it'll all be very romantic. But online dating is here to stay. Yes, it is. It's not going to go away. And I'd imagine as well that, uh, you know, in the old days, if you broke up with someone, you might end up, you know, y you had no real control over where you would go, when you would go dating again. You, you might be lucky, you might not, whatever. Whereas with online dating, you, you know... You hedge your bets. Yeah but, yeah, but also with online, it seems to me that if, you, if it doesn't work out with somebody, you can say, right, well, I'm ready to have another look, and then you go back on to... Whatever. Oh, you multi-date, Ronan. Yeah. This is what you do. You, you date four or five people at a time, mm. simultaneously. Mm. And that's acceptable. That's what everyone does. Right. And then the, the conversation back in the old days would have been, are we, you know, would you like to go on a date? Would yeah. you like to have dinner? Would you like yeah. to? The conversation now would be, right, do you want to go exclusive? Do you want to just date each other exclusively? Right. That's a big thing now. That's like almost from what I can see, almost like getting engaged now. Yes. If someone, because you, you know, you've, if you've several on the go, you're taking the heat off one. Yeah. And if one fella isn't returning a call, then there's another four. There's another, yeah. like, that's what you do. And in COVID, it was a godsend. It yeah. was an absolute godsend. What else had we? And, uh, but so, so, I mean, obviously, you, you, know, you had bad experiences, but generally speaking, it's yes. a good thing. Oh, it, is, it is a wonderful thing, and it's not going to change. Um, I just think probably for my time of life, yeah. I, mean, I went to a dating agency, I'll give you a laugh, an actual agency, an old-fashioned matchmaking agency where you pay a fee. Like the Knock Marriage Bureau. There, like yeah. the Knock yeah. Marriage Bureau. Listune Varna, yeah, maybe yeah, that's yeah, where yeah, I should yeah. be headed. Um, but exactly, like that. And you pay a fee, and you're guaranteed X number of dates a yeah, year yeah. and the whole thing is that this agency will vet the person yeah. really carefully and they're going to yeah. make sure that you're very well matched but I went to this agency and it was just a putative chat about yeah. joining I hadn't yeah. handed over any cash um, but they were very honest with me and I respected the honesty and they said look we can take your money and we can match you up with like whoever will agree to meet you but the fact is my age I'm in my 50s um, the fact is that Guys my age and a little bit older, I mean, not like my dad's yeah. age, but, you know, a little bit older, not, uh, but within this yeah. category, they don't want to be with anyone my age. They want 30-somethings, maybe 40-somethings at a push, and they can get them, and they are in the buyer's market. Um, so they said, really, I, you know, stick with online because it, it, this way we'll just be taking your money and you could be disappointed. And I respected the honesty. Really? Yeah. yeah, I suppose there's no I point did. in messing you there around no and taking and they, your money. They didn't others. charge me. It was just, you know, I, it, I just left thinking that's the reality. They were being, they were being upfront and realistic. And I, I respected the pragmatism, if not the romanticism. Uh, the uh, you you talk about this algorithm, which is based on uh, Marcel Proust, who we know as the author of the famous book. A Victorian book, uh, parlor game. Did yes. you know that? Was it he that invented it? So it's it's a it's a game of thirty four questions. Is it, you it have thirty four. I, I obviously tweaked them and yeah. added in a lot yeah. more. So tell us a little updated. bit about the Victorian. Well, the Victorian uh, parlour game was back in the days of gaslight and horse-drawn carriages. Yeah. The long winter evenings would just fly by playing yeah. this particular Proust uh, game. And it's it's questions, but it's not any regular Q&A. It's ones that you need to give an awful lot of thought to. It's like, if I can just ask you one now, um, when were you happiest? Wow. <laughs> you yeah. see, exactly. have to think about that. You, you yeah. do have to give yeah. thought. You have to go, most people go, my wedding day yeah, or yeah, yeah, um, sure. a day some very big life altering yeah. event happened. Um, some people say today, you know, some people yeah. just, yeah. But it's questions like that. Um, what historical figure do you most admire? 
I think those are very, very interesting questions, they're, actually. They're, yeah. you, you also, you can't blag them. My historical figure is Mary, Queen of Scots. Do you want to know why? Why? Because she died really well. Was she, she executed by, well. by Queen She Elizabeth. was, but she died very bravely. Her death was, if you read about her actual death, yes. she wore red. She wasn't going down easy. You know, she, she was determined. She knew this is one for the history books, and I just, it just impressed me. Um, similarly, Charles I, because uh, he wore two shirts to his own execution because he didn't want to be seen shivering. Shivering in the cold, and I thought, yeah. yeah no. But uh, anyway, questions like that that make you think. So my character in The Love Algorithm, yeah. shameless plug, um, decides, okay, why don't I ask deeper questions? and devise an algorithm that will match people up with a little bit more thought put into yeah. it, other than Guy, who I met in the first chapter of the book, who basically yeah. got a free meal out of me and then just, I never saw him for dust. Yeah. Um, and it goes from there. It's a very, it's a very interesting idea, actually. I, mean, I wish somebody have you, have you, could yeah, yeah, I, wish I could walk. code. Uh, we yeah. should go into business, Ronan. We yeah. definitely get a Gen well, I, I don't to know anything it. about code, and I'm afraid I'm the wrong person there. But the the this is your 18th novel, so you wrote your first one back in 20, 2004. In the dressing rooms of Fair City, when I yes. was meant to be learning my lines. Yes, that's what I was really at, secretly at, and uh, yeah. And our script editor on the on Fair City at the time is my great pal to this day, Liz Nugent. <laughs> so yeah. the two of us were kind of working away on books as sidelines, um, although slightly different markets. Liz, as you know, writes extraordinary yeah. crime fiction. Um, but anyway, yes. So I liken it. It's a book a year, and it takes me. It would take me a year to write a book. Um, I liken it to doing the Leaving Cert yes. every single year. So I feel like I've been doing the Leaving Cert sure. for the last 18, actually 19 years, because I just, only today, I delivered book number 19. Wow. So it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling when you press the send key and you go, oh, you know, reconnect with life now. And do you have a, do you pres presumably you have a lot of loyal readers at this time who are waiting for your book to come out every well, year? Well, it's like a footballer. You're only as good as your last game. Yeah, You're only sure. as good as your last match. So, um, yeah, readers are, are, are just incredible. And social media has been a godsend mm -hmm. in that way, in that they can contact you directly. And boy, they will tell you. If they don't like a book, you will know all about it. Um, and similarly, reviewers, and I respect that. Um, but, yeah, I... I I just tried, I mean, I like to try to write about ordinary women who find mm. them, ordinary people, I should say, who find themselves in extraordinary situations. Talk, yes. um, but this year was a big one for me because I had a play um, adapted, I adapted mm. it myself from one of my own books, The Secrets of Primrose Square. And it got to the stage during COVID. We were COVID. Mm. We had a lot of COVID closures three times. Mm. We had we had tours lined up. We had everything lined up, and then COVID. What could you do? Everything yeah, had to course, be done yeah, within the yeah. restrictions. But this year, it travelled to Canada, um, and I thought I am going to be there. I'm going to just be there in the front row on the opening night. So it was extraordinary to go over mm. and sit in an actual theatre with actual bums on actual seats mm. and see something. Um, that, that I wrote on the stage with Canadian cast and crew. Um, but it was extraordinary. I, I spoke a lot, my great pal of mine and Dave's there behind the camera is Mr. Patrick Kinnavan mm. and of this parish. And he, his tours, his plays tour all over the world with Fish Amble Theatre Company. And I was saying, oh, I'm so nervous. Like, will a Canadian audience like it? Will they mm. get, because it's very Irish and it's quite Dublin yeah. in parts, this particular play. And it's actually based on a quote that, by Eleanor Roosevelt, mm. oh, um, yeah, where she said, yeah, I mean, a woman is like a tea bag. You don't know how strong she is until dipped in hot water. And ain't that the truth? Mm. So Pat just gave me great advice. He said, write it local, write local, and it'll play anywhere. And I stuck with what he said, and thankfully it worked. It's a universal it's story, though, isn't well, it? Well, really? yeah, it's about... Um, it's about a woman who's, it, it, the, the image of it came to me, I'm often asked where do you get the ideas for your books, and the idea for that one came to me in an image, literally, of just this middle-aged woman in her 40s, played by my best friend Clelia Murphy in mm. the show, mm. and uh, played to perfection. And uh, she's standing, it's middle of the night, and this woman is standing huddled under an umbrella in mm. the lashing rain in a residential square mm. that you would see anywhere in Dublin. It's actually set on, in my mind's eye, Pierce Square, mm. which is not a million miles from here. Mm. And it's a residential square that's getting rapidly gentrified. Um, and 
she's just staring. She's looking up at this house with a light in a top floor window and she's just staring fixatedly at this light in the window. And you think, and we realise there's a teenage boy on the mm. other side of the, the bedroom. And we think, the reader thinks, jeez, is this weird? Like, is she crushing on some underage kid? Is this weird stuff going on here? Like, what's going on? And we realise then her daughter, this woman's daughter, has died. And she blames this kid for her daughter's death. And she thinks, you know, the coroner, you mm. might have been exonerated by the DPP, but I'll never exonerate you. And I'm keeping vigil here for my daughter. And that's how the story starts. Fantastic. Not yeah. telling you anymore. Good. There you go. <laughs> and but, um, you... The scariest thing I've ever done, writing a play. The scariest. Really? And you've done the a... I mean, most terrifying. Yeah. Isn't, isn't, isn't the whole... I mean, you're, you're, you, you chose for yourself to kind of... Quite insecure professions, really. Uh, you know, acting and, and writing couldn't really. be less. In so, so that's that's a big claim yeah. to make. Yeah, um, you never thought of being an accountant or anything like that. No? And you know, it's funny. I did commerce in UCD, yeah. but I, accountancy. Oh my God! I mean, it's handy for doing the L tax returns. That's yeah. the only thing. Yes, me and the revenue are clear. Okay. Yes. Good. Good. I'm glad that they'll, they'll be yeah. glad to hear that. Com, the BCom came in handy. Good. I didn't know you had a BCom, but that's yeah. that's, that's that's quite interesting. And you. Um, when you decided, you're obviously best known, I guess, for a lot of people as Nicola Prendergast in uh, Fair oh, City. Oh, do you know, wrong and it's hilarious. I still get abuse on the street because Nicola is not a very nice person. Yes. She says, you, when have I time to watch the soap operas? But um, my character is basically, long story short, I describe her as the kind of person you would want beside you in the trenches yeah. if you were going to battle yeah. because she's so organised. She is yeah. so, she's like, you know, officer class organised. <laughs> But the kind of person that if they lived, if they moved in next door to you, you'd end up selling your house to get away from them mm. because she is so insufferable. Um, snobby to the point where she doesn't even realise she's being snobby, no sense of humour, can't understand why she's no friends, mm. can't understand why no one likes her, but loyal to the death, really. Um, and you, Patricia Scanlon said to me, when you're writing or playing a baddie, mm. um, and all my career, my, my casting has been <laughs> menopausal, I say bitches are witches, really, yeah, pretty yeah. much. That's it, bitches, bitches are witches. Um, but Patricia Scanlon gave me great advice. She said, when you're writing or playing um, a dislikable character, yeah. no one's born like that, Ronan. Yeah, no, they're no not. one's no, born no, no, mean, no. no one's born horrible. So you always, as an actor, try to find out, well, what is it, that, what is it in this person's life that made them like that? Yes. So I think with my Nicola baddie from Fairy City, who no one likes, and to this day no one likes, it's just that she, the love of her life was her, her husband, her ex-husband, mm. Paul, and she would kill for him. She mm. would die for him or her son. And she's blind to all their flaws, you know, to the point that if Paul Brennan rang her up and said, OK, there's a body at the back, she'd say, right, I'll get one shovel, you get another, we'll wait until dark, mm. and I'll see you there, and then never speak of it again. She's that loyal. Uh, so that's what I... You have to see the good yes. to play the bad, I believe. And you, you, you haven't played that, that, uh, that uh, character full time for what? Maybe 10, 15 years? No, uh, I was back in the show in COVID times. Right. Yeah, so about 2021. Yes. In COVID, um, the so show, you as you know, kept going. Yeah. 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 Um, so, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, you mean full time? Yeah, yes, yeah. it would have been about 2007. But um, the way I describe it is Nicola, a bit like, I don't know if you know the musical Wicked, but a bit yeah. like Alphabet in Wicked, yeah. you know, the green. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's allowed to kind of fly in and out every now and then on her broomstick. Nicola officially yeah. lives in Cork. Yes. The poor people of Cork. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> exactly. I apologise yeah. to Corkonians. Um, and when I asked to leave the show, the then producer, Niall Matthews, famously said to me, um, well, we won't put you in a coffin. And I thought, well, that's not very nice. And it's only now, mm. when I think about it retrospectively, you think, actually, once they put a soap opera character in a coffin, that's it. Yeah, of that's course. It. Unless, of course, you're back. Bobby Ewing but from... Unless, well, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> but you can, if, if, as long as you're alive, you can kind of dip in and out. So I, the way I put it is, Nicola likes to fly into Carrickstown every now and then, cackle around the cauldron, yeah. stir, and then 
off again on the old broomstick. Fantastic. So you never know. You never know. And I'm doing a play. Can I yes, say I was going to ask you about oh, that. This is you, this is Red yes. Star and Red uh, Army. Sorry, it's Red Army, and it's yes. got nothing to do with our friends, the Russians. So it tell us. It doesn't. About it. Although that a story lies in there. Um, yes, it's uh, written by uh, Mary Boylan and Helen Helena Gallagher, and it's got four women in their fifties who are the maddest Munster rugby fans in the whole world, and we're playing in the Lime Tree, the beautiful Lime Tree Theatre in Limerick from the 22nd to the 29th of October. Thank you for the shameless plug. And, it's, and I, um, this, is, this is set in the, the aftermath of the death yeah, of Axel Foley, which I, is I tell, terrible I'll tell shock. I'll the truth. Um, I know nothing about any sport, never mind rugby. I'm researching like a lunatic now, you can imagine. But it, the, the show is set, it's about these Munster rugby fans who travel all around Europe passionately to see to support their team and apparently they say Leinster fans put a jersey on to go to a match because they want to support the team mm. Munster fans put a jersey on in case they're called up to play yeah. that's the difference <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the level of passion is actually yeah. humbling like it's un un astonishing and it's about these four women and they're in Paris 2016 eve of a match massive yes. big match yeah, that right. Munster are playing in and the word fi filters through that Axel Foley has died very tragically in a Paris hotel room and I'm not telling you anymore but, and but that stand is up and fight until we hear the bell that's I will right. sing it for you if you like off you go or not <laughs> the, the, the this play is you know, you're going into rehearsals for that so you're hoping did, did I did, did we say that the end of October is the the date it's when we will be playing yes yeah. and you've you've had a number of books options is that right I mean are you hoping that some of them optioned yeah but you know oh god the first one was optioned and um, I, my mother was like immediately on her diet for yeah. the premiere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were taken off yeah. to LA, meet the producers, um, all of this. And I thought, oh my God, this is just overwhelming. I was dining out on yeah. this. I was telling everybody who listened yeah. to me. But I have since learned that there is a long, long road between being optioned yeah. and being actually greenlit yeah, for yeah. something. And one producer said to me, the reality is most movies or TV series, because I've had books yeah, adap yeah. Uh, uh, adapted, or sorry, optioned for both, yeah. most of them don't get made. And I'm realizing now, when you go to Savoy 1 um, to see something, it's actually a miracle. When anything yeah. makes it to the screen, it is quite miraculous. Um, I was given great advice from John Boyne, who the yeah, uh, yeah. Boyne's Stripe Pajamas had just come out to great success. And he said, really, until you're sitting in, in movies at Dundrum with a bucket of popcorn on your knee, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a pipe an dream. extra string to your bow. It's you know they, they pay you for the option, which is very very nice. And he said really until it's in the cinema, it's you just don't know, you just don't know. So it's a lovely validation though I have to say. It's lovely to think that a producer course, yeah. has read this and thinks actually this might have a life beyond the printed page mm. or possibly to stage. Um, it's it's a great validation. Great. And what, uh, tell us a little bit, uh, finally, about your next novel. Can you tell us anything oh, about it? Oh, I can it? tell you the title. Go on. It's called Knock Once for Yes. Do you like right. the title? Yes. Yeah. It's a romantic comedy about grief. A comedy about grief. Does that make any sense? <laughs> um, sort of, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's based on a true story, I heard. Um, again, back to where do you get your ideas from. After the, the tsunami, um, a lot of people, uh, the Japanese tsunami, mm. that is, a lot of people at the time who, I mean, Thousands, so many people lost, were devastated, were left devastated, mm, had lost loved course, ones, yeah. um, and didn't even have a body to grieve over, yeah. and never knew what yeah. had happened to their loved one in their final hours. Yeah. And there was an apocryphal story of an old fashioned payphone, you know, the one, yeah, like yeah. the ones that Doctor Who would go into, like a TARDIS, um, that would ring, that was ringing in Japan, and leaving, they called it the wind phone, was leaving messages for people. And people got it into their heads that this was from the dead. And it was messages from a phone, from a loved one. And I thought, wouldn't it be really funny if you got a message on your mobile from a departed loved one who you were grieving? But it wasn't like, you know, the meaning of life, death, and the mm. universe. It was like, did you remember this is bin day? Yeah, I was just going to say that you, you put out the bins. <laughs> you, if my mother passed away tomorrow um, and came, it could ring me on a phone, she would say, what's happening Coronation Street? I can't get it here. What's happening? Is the crown back on yet? Yes. That'd be, that would be the first item of news on the agenda. So it went from there, but I'm not telling anymore. 
Uh, when do you expect that book to come out? Um, well, uh, hopefully next year, but you never know with publication dates. So it's only just literally been delivered. The editing process takes me a good year, really. Really, yeah. yeah I mean, I, it'll go off now for first draft edits. And that's um, where the bit, you know, the major edits where you rip a book apart, yeah. as you know, yeah. and you restitch it all together again, and you're thinking, oh my God, no one's ever going to read this. Um, and then you go to second, third draft edits, and then you get to the copy edit, which is what I call the anorak edit. Yeah, yeah. It's like kind of anorak facts. Yeah. Like I got one recently, and it was. Um, uh, you mentioned that there's an 805 flight, that there's an 8 a.m. flight to London, that your character gets an eight o'clock flight to London. There is no 8 a.m. flight. There's an 810 going to Heathrow. Yeah. There's a 750 going to Stansted. There's a uh, 740 going to Gatwick. Yeah. Please specify. And you think, oh, God. And then you realise, no, that's just, you know, if you're a regular it's commuter, it's just authenticity. It's authenticity. Yeah. And it's also respect for your reader. Uh, so, so to get it right, yeah. anyway, but it takes, it can take eight months upwards to well, do that. So that's what's ahead of me. Well, I wish you the very best of luck. Well, thank you very much. Claudia Carl, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. I'm so sorry I hardly ever let you get a word in, but thank you very much for letting me yak at you <laughs> about online dating. It's been all our pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ron.